with an idea and you think that idea can become a business, how do you make money? Trying to figure out who's going to be my customer or what am I going to do for this customer? Good evening. Uh, so what I really wanted to talk about today uh, kind of follows a little bit of what uh, Chris said to begin with when he showed that graphic that with the, was it trough of, trough of sorrow. So um, let's see here. Uh, you start up with an idea and you think that idea can become a business. And um, a lot of things have to happen uh, in that process. Once you decide for yourself, you know, a lot of people go through a lot of thought processes. Can it be a business? Can it not be a business? Should I go for it? Should I not go for it? It's now the time, not the time. Once you decide to go for it and you start sharing that decision with other people, a lot of people get excited on your behalf. So if you remember Chris's little curve, there was a little spike after you made a decision. So that sort of brings you to a level of happiness. People gave you a lot of pop positive feedback. A lot of people want to be supportive of, of people that take that decision of starting their own business. Um, and then something else starts to happen in my experience, and that is um, a lot of people have good advice for you. And it's all well-meaning. They have people that they want to refer to who might uh, help you out somehow, people that you can buy from, people you can sell to, people you can hire, uh, trade shows you should go to, uh, software you should buy, all sorts of things are gonna happen. And it all ends up being a little bit overwhelming, and if you haven't done this before, a little bit confusing. So what I wanna to talk to you about today is maybe sort of just a simple structure of thinking of, well, you know, maybe I don't need to do everything at the same time. Maybe, you know, I can just politely say thanks and not right now, I'll get to that a little bit later, as a way of helping to deal with all that incoming and positive energy without necessarily seeming rude or, 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 or thankless in the process. So <clears throat> the first thing that you need to focus on when you start a business, and this doesn't apply for all startups, but here at Mars we get a lot of startups in very technology intense businesses. So especially if you are in this clean tech space dealing with renewable energy or energy efficiency or uh, some sort of uh, complicated engineering water stuff, um, or if you're in the medical field and the stuff that you're creating is impacting people's health. You have to go through a period of technology validation and the purpose of that is very simple. You gotta make sure that while you, that you can actually do the job without necessarily killing or harming somebody else. Uh, that's the sort of the essence of that process. And when it comes to so, some of these uh, technology validation processes, they're actually also designed to meet regulatory requirements. Uh, so that's the focus of, this, of your business at that point in time. You're not trying to get customers, you're not trying to sell, you're not building, you don't need a CRM system at this point in time. What you need is, you need to really understand the regulatory environment that you're getting into you are potentially in the process of technology validation, you might end up creating a lot of IP, so you wanna to try to understand if that's IP that you need to protect and what's the process is for doing that. And you need to understand the timelines because at this point, especially in the, we see in the medical field, the technology validation can take a lot of time. You were talking about years here, and you need to, have to, you need to find the time, or the, or the, sorry, the funding that will give you that time. So there's writing of grant applications and similar, they need to happen. Maybe looking for um, some other family money or, or maybe an angel investor really early on that believes in this kind of technology. Technology validation, not really a big deal for what I call web-based startups because, <clears throat> well, web-based startups, you're just reconfiguring something that somebody else is already using. Like we know how a hyperlink works, we know how embedding code works, you're just trying to do it in a different way, so it's not really a different technology per se, it's a different configuration of technology. So, so technology validation, you can sort of skip if you're building a web-based business and go right directly to what we call problem validation. So at this stage, the focus of your business and the overarching priority for what you do should be trying to figure out who's gonna be my customer and what am I gonna do for this customer? You cannot do that without somehow starting to engage with the customer. So 
you have to get out, you have to get out of the building, you have to find out where your customers are, and you have to, have to start an interaction that is designed to help you understand and become the expert, not in the product that you're building, but in the problem that your customer has. Only when you understand that can you actually design a proper product, and that's kind of the next part of this process. Sometimes there's a bit of an overlap between the problem and the solution validation process. There really should be a little bit of interaction between the two because you need your product people to get the input from the, your customer discovery so that they're designing something that is relevant. But in the problem discovery phase, the problem validation phase, what you're trying to do is figure out, am I solving or can my technology solve a problem that is urgent and valuable for your customer? Because if it's not, nobody's going to want to pay, and there isn't a market for what you're trying to do. And believe me, it is the case for a lot, a lot of ideas that we see. So being careful in customer validation and thinking that, and being open-minded so that you don't necessarily believe that your original thoughts around how this market operates are always true, but being able to learn and generate insights, not just from conversations with customers, but in this process you're going to engage with advisors, you're going to engage with, engage with people that are probably on the finance side, VCs, probably lawyers, maybe other entrepreneurs that have done it before. You're going to get a lot of data points. So at the back end of what you're trying to do between yourself and maybe your co-founders at this point in time is to take a lot of information and generate insights that allow you to move forward. As, as Chris said when he started out, don't necessarily believe that you have figured it out right from the get-go. Some of the assumptions that you made when you started out are going to be wrong and you have to have an open mind and figure out where to go next. You know what, if you are going to change, what are you going to change to? So the way you engage with the marketplace, both when you're validating your problem and your solution, is what gives you, I wouldn't say black and white data, in most cases sort of a shade of gray that you're gonna get back, but <clears throat> the essence is that that's a lot better than just going by assumption. Um, the problem and solutioning, having that, and believe me, that's a massive, massive achievement. On getting to a validated problem and getting to a solution that can actually solve that problem, a solution that people want to build, uh, that's a huge, huge achievement. And a lot of our startups, I would say almost 50%, do not make it past this stage. So while I might say, that, say it and, and it sounds easy and, and self-evident, uh, when it actually comes down to doing the work, when it comes down to fine-tuning your ears and your listening devices so you're actually absorbing lots of signals, you know, a lot of people find that a lot more challenging than it actually sounds. But the two of them together makes you a value proposition. And getting to value proposition is sort of the, the first big, big milestone, I would say, uh, if you are a web startup. Um, I would say the biggest milestone, if you are a, a sort of a medical or a clean tech that I started out with, is just getting through a tech, tech validation phase. That's a completely different uh, animal altogether. Um, so the problem, solution, getting to a value proposition statement, that's the basis for you creating a, a business model. And now you, what you're focusing on is just figuring out how do you make money? If you're not making money, you don't have a business. And as Peter Drucker said, you know, I know he's been quoted before today, so I'm a little bit uh, old here. But um, you know, he said, the purpose of a business is to create a customer. And that's what you're starting to investigate when you're, when you're designing your business model, is to figure out, okay, well, I got something, and I think I, have, I understand what the customer is, how do I put it together so that I can start generating customers on a repeatable and scalable manner? And really what we're trying to do here is figuring out, take out some of the uncertainty around revenue generation. You know, are you able to sell this all online? Do you need there to be some people involved? Maybe do you need a sort of a bag carrying salesperson to sell this for you? Um, or you know, should I drive this through marketing on, in trade shows, or am I spending my entire budget on Facebook advertising? Those are the things that you're trying to figure out at this stage to a large extent. 
if you have a physical product, at this point in time, you're also very concerned with your supply chain, and a lot of companies at this stage are finding themselves on a plane to China to sort, to sort out a relationship with a potential contract manufacturer uh, these days. Uh, as you move through the business model validation stage, uh, you really are having to start the conversation about funding. The business model validation on the previous stages, you're staying lean. You're, you don't have a big team, you don't make any investments, and you don't make any big commitments at this point in time, because in the process of figuring out both what your problem is, your solution, and your business model, you know these are all very iterative processes. So you don't want to have to change your business 180 degrees over and over again. People don't have the stomach for it, and most founders probably don't have the stomach for it either. So if you stay close, you're a small and nimble startup team at this process, you can handle these kind of, you can walk through the different product iterations, you can walk through the different notions about who should be your target customers and all that kind of stuff if you're a close-knit founders team at this point in time that have worked on the discovery process together and share the same understanding of the data that you get in that process. So getting to a validated business model, and at this point in time, I'm talking about 20% of the startups. Roughly 20% of the startups that we see make it through to efficiency. So just so you understand the trajectory here, there's a lot of things, and figuring out how to get customers on a repeatable basis, it's a tough job. It's a tough job, and not everybody gets there. But at getting through, now hopefully you may have some seed funding that allows you to work and, uh, and, uh, and start building some, a little bit of scale in your business. And the first thing you do is that you're looking at what's the best way of ramping up sales and marketing. Not in a big bad way, but just a little bit more so that you can drive efficiency in your customer acquisition process. You want to have a customer acquisition process that you really understand that if you're putting a dollar more into your marketing budget, you understand whether or not it drives somebody, you know, X number more people to, to your website, or whether or not it drives uh, more people to pick up the phone and give you a call or something like that. Like you want to get to that kind of understanding, and that work takes place in this efficiency stage. So, but still, you're on the hunt for funding because now you are in a really good position to talk to, to investors having a validated business model. You have data points that a lot of investors are looking for. Um, the next point, and this is kind of where we move from being a startup to becoming a, a bigger business, is the scaling phase. The words that I'm using here come from a project called the Startup Genome. Startup Genome is a, it's a big project where, uh, have, that have taken I think at this point over 50,000 different businesses uh, through a benchmarking uh, process. So these stages that are, are described here are sort of derived mostly from that work and so, some of the work that we do here that focus more on the, the medical and the, the clean tech type companies. But scaling, you're still de driving, uh, dealing with, with funding and trying to build scale, so you need to have the capacity to ramp up. But the underlying focus now is growth. So at this point, now you're, you're ramping up and you're hiring a lot of people and you're professionalizing your organization. In the early stages, when you're dealing with problem, solution, business model validation, everyone in the organization is sort of all hands on deck and have to be able, as, as, uh, as Chris said initially, you know, sometimes sweep the stairs. It doesn't matter what you think your title is, you are sweeping the stairs at some point, uh, just because. Uh, but when you come to scaling, you're building a professional organization, and you're not all hands on deck. You're trying to fit people into very specific jobs because you know those are jobs that need to be done at this point in time. As a consequence, a lot of the people that you onboarded, maybe in your business model validation stage, are saying, this is not for me anymore. I kind of like the, you know, the scruffy existence of, uh, of the early stage startup, and that's kind of the world I'm, I'm thriving in. So, They'll, they'll take their backpack and head out. And some of them you may have to fire if they're a little bit slow at that because they don't fit into the culture that you're trying to build uh, going forward. But uh, the scaling is where you go from being a startup into really being a business with professional management. So you're also really trying to find out 
who are the managers that I can hire that can actually build the functions that I need as a professional business? Sales, marketing, finance, legal, pro product development, you know, whatever the, the business needs, you have to fire, uh, and, and sorry, you have to hire a really competent management team. So all of this uh, taken together, really what I'm trying to, to describe here is a process of de-risking. So <clears throat> while you have themes for each stage, you know, the message that I want to send is that you tackle the biggest uncertainty that surrounds your idea at one at a time. So the sort of themes that allow you to do that. And if you think about that confusing situation that you started off with, but people have suggestions for hire this, buy this, get this system, all those kind of things. What I'm hoping is that by showing you this, that you have an idea for when to have the right types of conversations and what not to get involved with really early on, when you should be focusing all of your resources on the big, big, big questions for your business. Uh, two side comments, um, all along the process here, if you make it to scaling, you know, you have to be, be very cognizant of what kind of culture you're creating for your business. Building a, a culture, first and foremost, uh, a learning uh, culture, because startups are a lot about learning, about becoming smarter, and really I think the most successful startups are, you know, when I look across them, the one thing I see that it characterizes them is that they have the ability as organizations to learn incredibly fast, and with that I mean not just understand what's happening, but translate it into businesses, business opportunity, new products, new ideas, and move forward very, very quickly. So build a, a, a culture that is conducive to quick and fast learning. And, uh, and, to <clears throat> and the other part I wanted to mention is, is the part about momentum. There are certain times in the trajectory that I just described that your moment, momentum might be under threat. Uh, this is a personal opinion of uh, mine. I've seen a lot of startups, and I've been part of startups, where you know, the underlying momentum seemed to be a lot of what is energizing everyone. And at times you may have to pivot and you may have to try, uh, change direction. Uh, and that's sort of critical times. And if you don't make it out of those kind of situations with the momentum intact, in then there's a good risk that the project will just die. So uh, keep, keep an eye on, on momentum. Be aware of, of, the, of the risk around that. Um, and um, hopefully this provides you a little bit of an idea of what the journey that uh, you're facing uh, looks like ahead. Thank you.